my spouse and partner in education things for about 30 years. Just quickly, I'll give you a little background. Uh, we want to show uh, something we've created. And then, uh, you know, uh, we'd love, because it's not, these aren't long sessions, you know, we just sort of touch on it a little bit. Uh, you should have gotten an invitation in your uh, swag bag for a free classroom enrollment in the program that we've created, which is based on classic drama and on common core text exemplars. Uh, the background is that uh, about 30 years ago, I was, uh, at, I was a student at the Yale School of Drama, a playwright, and Annabelle was a fifth grade teacher in New York City. And she could not get her kids interested in uh, the Greeks and Romans. No way. <laughs> they just were not interested. The textbook was dull. So many, many years ago, uh, she had the idea, well, what if we hook the kids by having them read um, a classic Greek play? And then we look for a, a, you know, a simplified version that her fifth graders in New York City could, could attack, and we couldn't find one. So Annabelle said, well, you're a playwright, you know. I said, yeah, but you're a teacher. We sort of argued about which one should write this adaptation. But we adapted Antigone, did it together. And it formed the basis, I'll just pass this around, of a print series that we sold worldwide, uh, uh, all sort of English-speaking countries. Uh, and then we actually got picked up by a real publisher. Uh, and then this when we... done on one of those desktop Macs. We had a 512 Macintosh in 1985, and we drew all these little things, you know, and then it uh, progressed. And um, in the intervening years, we've done many other things. I, I ran the editorial department of Weekly Reader when, it was, when the company was here in Connecticut, and I created StoryWorks magazine at Scholastic. Annabelle's worked for all the major textbook publishers. In fact, she was one of the authors of a, of a textbook on theater for high school. Very recently, the last few years, we have started a nonprofit to focus on education innovations that uh, uh, increase student motivation, use 21st technolo century technology, and has measurable results. We created the official CMT League, which was for the Connecticut Mastery Test, and we've had, for the past few years, about 10% of Connecticut's kids in grades 2 through 8 uh, using an online game system that we invented to prep for the thinking, not necessarily the test prep, but for the thinking behind what was being tested on the CMTs. So now we come full circle. We recently got a grant to explore what to do in response to the Common Core and um, you know, what to do using 21st century technology. So we kind of revived the 28 uh, adaptations of classic plays and extended those techniques that we learned over many years ago and, and embodied in print. And there's also a board game, by the way, but I couldn't find, uh, I think there's one in the attic. <laughs> but um, to take some of those. Innovation with that board game, which I was, I, I wanted yeah, we're to proud of this. So this that we can put this board game online as well. But the innovation with it was that when I was a fifth grade homeroom teacher in New York, um, I found that even then, and that was, ugh, what, 25 years ago? A while ago. Um, even then, before internet, before all these devices, the kids were bored stiff with the textbooks. I mean, it was just a big old chunk of sandwich with nothing in the middle. It just looked like something dry, and what's that? And so I remember saying to the kids, here's a book, what do you think of it? And we just sat around talking about the history book, and... Um, decided that it just wasn't all that engaging. So I showed them my teacher's edition, and there was a noticeable rise in the engagement because the teacher's edition has all that marginalia that the kids don't get. And immediately it's like, hang on, what are they telling you that they're not telling us? And, and you've got all this extra stuff. So when we try to do things, we try to give the kids everything. We don't hold back. We let the kids and the teachers, you don't know what the kids might be interested in. So with the board game, instead of it just being another trivia game where the question comes up at random, if it's not your turn, you're looking out the window, um, the innovation was that the little booklet that's coming around, I created a board that, that um, traced the history of, of the creation of a play, from finding a playwright to finding the initial site where the play was done. And yeah. taking you, as you play the game, you go through the process until eventually it's the audience that owns the play. So you go through that process, but the questions that and you're learning, you're not just being tested, you're learning. How are you learning? Uh, the way we did it was that we gave everybody the teacher's edition book. 
to the game. All the answers, all the questions. So if, if you look at the little, the little pamphlet-y type thing. For it playing, then, uh, and it's your turn to answer a question, we've all got our books open, you haven't, and we go, I think he doesn't know question four. We all read question four. We're constantly looking, reading, we're even trying to remember what you know and don't know. And then it's your turn, and then you can, you know. So it's sneaky. So they constant, and soon they go, we know all this. And then you start to write some more questions. Yeah. So we had, for example, in one hour of playing that game at the um, Dwight School on Edgewood Avenue, when it was on Edgewood Avenue back in that day, uh, there were fifth grade, uh, a, a room full of fifth grade kids knew more about Shakespeare details, you know, details and facts than I did. And I was, you know, studying at Yale, you know, it, because it snuck up on them in trying to compete. They were powerfully evaluating content and wondering, well, what question am I going to ask you? They want to beat you, you know, but they're actually learning while not even thinking about it. Anyway, we don't have that on yeah. yet. But yeah, we'd like to, we'd definitely like to get a grant. To to so if you guys know any generous billionaires who are interested in supporting <laughs> education and who would like to support the development of a massive multiplayer game based on classic theater, let us know <laughs> who it Meanwhile. might be. Meanwhile, we did get a grant, as I said, to pilot uh, taking these techniques from paper and putting them in pixels. So that's why we were attracted to the sound of this unconference today. Uh, and uh, we piloted this in New Britain and with third, fourth, and fifth grade kids doing uh, a play called Life is a Dream. And if you go to our website, bigfuneducation.org, we got covered by NBC. Yeah, I guess. Okay, we'll do that. Just a quick two minute. And this tells you a lot. They're very good. Uh, this tells you a big Y commercial first. Please join us in helping our local schools. Sign up for Big Y's Education Express program and help us reach our goal of three and a half million dollars in school supplies. Inspire the cloud with every purchase. What's going on? Am I really in a palace? The third, fourth, and fifth graders at North End School have embarked on a journey to the 17th century. I'm sure it's a dream again because what it is dreaming. Life is full of dreams. The classic play, Life is a Dream, by Calderon de la Barca, is their vehicle. Uh, this started as a project for studying the play, and then we decided that we're actually going to put it on. The work begins in the classroom as part of a pilot program developed by the nonprofit. Big fun education. Forrest Stone has been educating kids through plays for decades, but technology has now changed the game. It's enabling us to put that all on board on an interactive whiteboard right in front of the kids, right in the classroom, so teachers can interact with it. The lessons are geared toward the new Common Core standard. From the very beginning, a lot of it was just building vocabulary, building fluency development, and a lot of comprehension skills. So at first I didn't know what, what was going on. And then finally when we started doing the work and stuff, and then that's when I started to get it. And I was a genius that life was a genius. The visual radio play allows young kids to connect with the text. Why was it necessary to draw the thing What do you think? They started having a lot of discussions about Who's, who's who and who's related to the other one and you know everything, all the drama that was happening. Bringing the play to life on stage is the reward for their hard work in the classroom. I'm not dreaming. I learned who I am. As they tackle literacy in a way we could only have dreamed of just a few years ago. Brad Drazen, NBC Connected News. So that was a lot of this is dream. And in fact, you to pick up on what how they, they did a great job. And uh, as those of you who work in education know, when you watch the news and the story has to do with education, they never get it right. They, they don't go into the depth required. They, they, so that was remarkably good, actually, I thought. Um, so to pick up on how they what covered it. A common core play project, the St. Ives question. So uh, what we've done, as you can see, is, um, uh, it, well, in the case of the primary grades, we're taking common core text exemplars, like as I was going to St. Ives, and building some kind of play around it. In this case, the story, uh, which we can listen to very quickly, it's like three minutes long, but it's basically an American family has come to England, and the dad goes out for a walk one morning and hears the poem, uh, someone teaches him the poem as I was going to St. Ives, and he brings it back to his kids, and it's a riddle. 
Um, Hello. I'll skip that. Let me go right oh, to. We should, go, we should go through that. Yeah, it's a bit passive, though. We'll come back to it. Um, uh, just quickly, what, uh, for example, we have all these learning elements built in. So we have uh, vocabulary tagged according to the common core tiers of you know, tier one, tier two, and tier three. I don't know if you guys are aware of that yet, but it's um, uh, uh, tier three is the domain specific. It might come from history, from, from literature, uh, from science. Uh, tier two are the kinds of words that are g of general good use across all academic uh, uh, disciplines. And everyday words, which we don't focus on at the upper grades, but we do here at the primary grades, are words like walk and tea and day and things like just everyday vocabulary. Uh, so we've embedded those. We've also embedded... This music is called the Flora Dance. Cornish children learn the Flora Dance at school. This dance is done every May 8th. Children and adults dance together. The dancing moves through the town. It's like an American parade. The Flora Dance is a British tradition. People come from all over the world to Helston, Cornwall to see this dance. So we've embedded these nonfiction pieces that relate to uh, the play. The cast, Bob. Cast, American. this is uh, domain specific Bob to literature, to, to specifically the play form. The setting. The, the set, and just to. Did you have a good walk? Really good. Cornwall is beautiful. It reminds me of beaches in Massachusetts. He sips tea. Mm, great tea. Okay. So now, the, as far as to address the fluency piece, which you know, we wanted to address in this session, uh, you can imagine, particularly here at primary grades, you would do what we just did. You maybe listen to it three or four times with the kids. You would explore the words that are key to a given moment in the play. You might look at uh, how th these Stanislavski and little acting tips uh, just give you a, an idea of how you might read uh, some of these lines, and then you could keep the sound off and just have the kids start reading it, maybe first chorally, so that they, you know, they're not out on the limb reading individually with one lone voice, you know, uh, and then you could split up and do roles. Then we have a printable script, so if you, like the kids in New Britain, if your kids get inspired to take it all the way to production and make a real long-term deep project out of it, that we facilitate that in that way. Um, so uh, uh, f now for high school, we're doing, for, uh, in fact, tomorrow night, we're doing a recording of our version of Hamlet. Our version of Hamlet, as we test it with Flash Kincaid, it, re it comes out at a grade uh, reading level of about grade 2.7. The reason of that is not that we have dumbed down Hamlet, really. It's about betrayal, it's about murder, it's about a ghost, it's about madness, it's about all those things. The ace in the hole uh, with that is very simple, to be or not to be. The longest word in that sentence is not. The, the power of drama is that it's not all in the words. So much of the power of, a, of drama is in the white space. It's in the intention. It's in the misunderstanding. It's in what isn't said. In fact, it's what often the, the story is proceeding because somebody's hiding something. So uh, drama, in fact, uh, Annabelle's been talking with some of, the, some of the people who are really involved in the creation of the Common Core, and they admit that uh, dramatic texts are woefully neglected in American education. A lot of kids don't know how to read it. And yet, what's ironic about it is if you really take an inventory of what media do we consume more than any other thing, well, TV, movies, news, reality TV, radio, internet movies, all things that are dramatic in nature. As a culture, we increasingly are not consuming paper, continuous prose. We're, you know, we're, we're not consuming as much paper or, or words on the page verse. We're really consuming dramatic forms, and yet we don't teach it. And it's got a lot of specific things that have to do with uh, not only uh, the format, 
Uh, and as I say, the sort of literary structure of drama, which operates differently from even from prose fiction, much less from, from nonfiction, um, uh, but also uh, uh, it brings a, a new kind of active engagement with all the things you can tie around uh, a classic play. You know, with Macbeth, obviously we'll be writing about the gunpowder plot and about uh, Scotland and about, uh, you know, uh, um, fate, concepts of fate. What does the word weird come from? For the weird sisters, it comes from an old English word meaning fate or destiny. You know, with Hamlet, there's... <sighs> never get through Hamlet. <laughs> Right. Scene, the and the clocks. Yeah. And the so An American family just arrived in England. When you travel between America yeah. and England, time changes. You go across time zones. When it is 1 p.m. in New York, what time is it in London? So they actually. A lot of these things are not sort of designed to be the full lesson or the full unit on time zones, but more to create a the se cultural the setting. context. It is four o'clock in England. S sorry, go ahead. Cultural context and to get conversation going. I mean, a lot of thing about the um, Common Core is to try and shift over to there being speaking and listening. And it shouldn't just be the teacher doing all the speaking and the kids doing all the listening. So if I were to do this in a classroom and I was at all shy, you know, if, if I were not I to start with, if I was just a teacher who thought, well, this looks good, but I don't know about all that navigation and blah, blah, blah. Perfect project to let the kids take the lead. So I've got this thing, it looks cool, not quite sure how to navigate, and anyone want to be brave and take the first go at being a teacher? Um, remember, remember, this is K-1. Um, and I think that then you'll get kids um, leaning in and buying in because they're owning it a bit more. It's not just you saying today we're going to do this. And let them decide. Anyone interested in time zones? Anyone think they've gone across a time zone? Let's talk about it. How do you feel after you've gone over a time zone? Right. So, um, and and that same logic could extend into high school, obviously. You know, if you, uh, you know, look at one of our real world uh, pieces of nonfiction, you could get the kids to explore it on their own because uh, a couple of other little details I often forget to mention. One is this software plays anywhere, so kids can look at it at home, on a phone, on any device, Apple or PC. It plays obviously, we, we recommend whiteboard use for the school just because it makes it a sociable uh, engagement and you can really reach out. There are quizzes at the end of each chunk, as you can see, I'm hovering over. Uh, these are text-dependent questions that would have to do with, um, again, very simply, uh, uh, have to do with the introduction, with the cast and setting. One of the interesting things that uh, sort of it's a, a mind shift for those of us who create educational materials is that uh, I think the most profound thing under the Common Core is that with knowledge so diverse, so huge and changing so often, both in its content and in its form. What the Common Core is trying to urge us to do as educators for the next generation is teach them to fish, not give them a fish. Teach them how to understand any, how to interact with any kind of complex text, you know, multimedia, this, that, and the other, and derive meaning from it and get what they want from it, rather than saying, okay, here's a list of 15 th facts and things you need to know. Instead, it's, it's a shift towards teaching, and I think it's true of math as well as uh, uh, language arts, but a shift from, from giving them a fish to teaching them to fish. And we've really tried to model that. So as you can see, we, you can see the answer in the visual. So the, so the point of this question isn't to remember that answer, it's to look at how am I going to look to start getting kids into a groove. You know, how am I going to look at this kind of piece of content and derive this kind of knowledge and, and start getting them uh, fluent in those skills? I don't know if there's any other. Yeah, well, why don't you just play the playthrough just because. You want to, okay. Three minutes, you know, okay. 
Okay. So. This, uh, this poem, this anonymous poem from England, I was shocked that it was there as a exemplar text. I have no idea. Welcome. Why. They put it a there. common. Hello. I didn't know how it would be relevant for American, young American K yeah. one American kids. What would they make of it? So I, I really felt it needed something. Yeah. Some kind of framework of reference around it. And I must say, though, we're also very excited because uh, we have um, Anne Nyberg from Channel 8 TV, uh, Brad Drazen from NBC in Hartford, and Kevin Hogan from CBS, uh, he, all local media people, are participating. Annabelle's done a delightful adaptation of Who Has Seen the Wind? The old Christina Rossetti poem, Who Has Seen the Wind? Neither you nor I, but when the trees are trembling, we, the wind is passing by. She's made it a newsroom where the, the, the station has decided to do poetic weather reports. And so we have Dan Dan, the weatherman, who is very skeptical about this, and Christina Rossetti is finding this, the, the market research very, like, we need to grow our audience. Growing an audience, what a fascinating term. And, you know, so she's really brought these into... Um, you know, opposition, and we have all those media people who are going to do the voicing, uh, you know, for, the, for that one for us, which is going to be a blast. Um, so it's an adventure. So it's, uh, okay. It is four o'clock in England. Bob and Kate drink tea. Three children play. Did you have a good walk? Really good. Cornwall is beautiful. It reminds me of beaches in Massachusetts. He sips tea. Great mm, tea. While you were out, you texted me. I did. I heard a riddle. Oh, fun. Tell me the riddle. Riddle? That's a funny word. Riddle, riddle, riddle. <laughs> <laughs> what is a riddle? It's a puzzle. A jigsaw puzzle? No, a riddle is a word puzzle. Is it a crossword? No, that's different. A riddle is a story. With a question at the end. Scene two. Tell us the riddle, then. Sure. On my morning walk, I met an Englishman. He told me a riddle about St. Ives. Cool. Here is the riddle. Ready? Yes. As I was going to St. Ives, I met a man with seven wives. Every wife had seven sacks. Every sack had seven cats. Every cat had seven kids. Kids, cats, sacks, wives. How many were going to St. Ives? What's the question? How many were going to St. Ives? Right. How many were going to St. Ives? That's the St. Ives question. Scene three. Let's count how many were going to St. Ives. One man and seven wives. Eight. Eight plus seven sacks, fifteen. No, no, no. Sacks aren't people. Don't add sacks. How many means how many people. That is true. I met a man with seven wives. Mom, a man can't have seven wives. You didn't say they were all his wives. Tell the story in your own words. See if that helps. Okay. A man went for a walk with his own wife and six female friends who were also married. Ah, uh, I think you are getting it. The kittens, cats, and sacks are not people. They mustn't count men. So it is he. One man and his seven friends. Eight people went to St. Ives. Is that right? No. One. One person went to St. Ives. What? One person walked towards St. Ives. Here she walked in one direction and... Oh, oh, I get it. The man telling the story is walking towards St. Ives. The other man and the seven wives are walking away from St. Ives. So only one man is going to St. Ives. Yes. So again, that's uh, for a K-1 thing. That's the whole story. It's three minutes, four minutes long. So it would give you plenty of time to repeat it, uh, you know, get the kids involved in the fluency piece. Uh, you know, you could cover all the vocabulary to make sure kids understood it. And, you know, what tends to happen is that kids uh, just, uh, 
it's well, it's happened for 30 years so far. Uh, kids uh, just want to take this further because it's different. It's just different. You know, the, the dramatic form is different from what they usually encounter. And usually, when they do encounter it in American schools, it's passive. It's not something they can get their hands on and start actually doing. Uh, so, uh, you know, we've tried to redress that um, that imbalance a little bit. So. Any questions, any, any feedback, any uh, um, uh, uh, ideas of how you might use this or, or something we haven't thought of? But the high school level, like with the would this, it would look the same? Well, you know, I mean, the smaller typefaces, uh, you know, a different kind of look and feel to make it, uh, you know, more adult feeling. But indeed, yeah, like for example, with the Macbeth, we don't soft soap that you know, a key plot point is a cesarean section, for example. You know, we, we go ahead and do that. We don't, uh, you know, uh, in The Life is a Dream, uh, there's a couple who are cousins who marry because they're a royal family and it's to unite, you know, their, the, 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 the fractioning parts of their kingdom. And I tell you what, the kids in, in uh, New Britain, the third, fourth, and fifth, the cousins were getting married? Like it was a whole episode of Jerry Springer that we had right there. And it was great because... It, you know, I think one, things that, one thing that, uh, you know, like being an American myself, I, I realize that I'm, I'm a little insulated from a lot of the world. And I think a lot of times you forget that different cultures throughout history have been really, really different, real significant differences. And that's another thing we try to, you know, reveal. Or, I sense that when I, yeah, I sense that kids don't always know whether, you know, in, in that one, it was set in Poland, it was a Spanish play set in Poland. I think the kids didn't know if Poland was a real place or not. Is this Harry Potter? What's going on? You know, they no context at all. Uh, most of these kids have never been outside of New Britain, they haven't even been to the shoreline. So, in order to build um, sort of a fluent cultural <laughs> literacy around that, we decided to create a Google Plus community called Mystery Hangout, and we connected, which you all welcome to join um, and use for any purpose, but the, the reason I wanted to do it was try and connect with um, kids and a teacher in Eastern Europe, and then do a mystery Skype with them, and have our kids, mystery Skype, I don't know if you've ever, you ever done that kind of a thing, mystery Hangout, mystery Skype, basically two, two, two adults get together and arrange a certain time where you're both going to be online through the, the video conferencing. And then um, it's sort of a mix of battleships and 20 questions. And you both have to try and figure out, ask strategic questions and figure out where the other lot is. Like what time is it where you are is a good one. Um, and then meanwhile, and it was done in a computer lab. So meanwhile, they have Google Maps up. They can search anything. There's no cheating. It's let's use technology and all the information available to us to, to figure our world out. So then they, we, Skype, we mystery hung out with these kids in the Ukraine. And, um, oh, it was brilliant. It was so much fun. They figured out we were in America really fast. <laughs> <laughs> but they were able to figure out what state we were in. Right, they did. And, and they did. our kids, our New Britain kids, went online, quick, quick, Google Translate, let's say something to them in Ukrainian. I mean, it was just, what? <laughs> it was the kids. They would have cared to do that. Suddenly it was real, it was relevant. Um, then when we came back to the play, they, they had a little bit more of an idea what that setting was. I would hope that you could do that with this. We want to build, we have a digital um, drama community also on Google. And I'm hoping that teachers who start doing these plays will go on there and set up, let's try and, let's try and hook you up with some schools in St. Ives. That's right. We also want to perform for each other and ask questions of each other. When we did Life is a Dream, we also used technology to show the Google Hangout. We got um, an actor in New York who is Polish to do his interpretation of one of the big speeches that the yeah. king gets where he's kind of questioning and, and you see he does have a conscience. He's not as cruel as we thought at the beginning. He's wondering, did I do the right thing? How am I going to know? Um, and uh, so we had this Polish actor in New York do a speech. So now the kids are comparing the radio play speech, which we got like an old guy, like 80-something-year-old guy who sounds like an old king, um, 
doing the speech. Then they heard a younger guy do it with a real ethnic sort of overlay and a more focus on the conscience part of it as opposed to, you know, I'm old, I'm handing on to the next generation. There was a whole other subtext to the way it was performed. And then the kids did a Google Hangout with that Polish actor from New York and said, hey, what did you think? This is me, I'm the one that did that. And they, their body language, they were coming up to the screen, they were talking about yeah. leaning in, they were walking in. It was their world now. And we were definitely, we were and calling. Then, and one of the kids got up, I'm playing King Vasilio. <laughs> yeah, I'm so proud this, of that. my play, you know. And they do take ownership of it. How, you know, where it seems small and timid and little, you know, I was looking at that and I thought, I, once the kids, because that's like a blueprint. The thing with a play is that it's a blueprint. It's like looking at a map of a house that hasn't been built and going, what? I'm not that impressed it's not a house. You know, you look at a play and you go, oh, I'm not that impressed it's not. What is it? Wait till you get the people there. Wait till it's actually built. It takes people to build a play. And then those people own it and the writer's mm -hmm. way out and the director eventually is out too because the director's not on the stage when it's performed. So... It really is the it's a natural process for education. Of consequence. And, um, yeah. Two other quick things, and then we're supposed to wrap up. But one is, um, when we were developing this in the late 1980s, and I was a student at Yale, I read in a, a theater history book that in uh, 5th century BC Athens, the one formal public schooling that a citizen got was to spend a year as a member of the chorus of a play. And, and that was their only formal public schooling. They had private tutors like, you know, uh, Alexander the Great had, great had Al Aristotle, good tutor. Uh, but, um, you know, so that's one kind of, it's something that gives us great confidence in this basic validity of this technique because it, you know, it goes back forever. Uh, the other thing that, um, uh, that occurred to me while, uh, you know, Annabelle was talking is just to say that uh, the, for the first year of this, we're calling it a digital drama festival because part of it's going to be an exploratory process of what do, what do different kids bring to this? What do different classrooms bring to this? How are we going to hook different teachers and classrooms up with like people in the theater community? Or, for example, uh, Annabelle got uh, a woman uh, who's a professor of astronomy at Harvard to be willing to uh, uh, Google Hangout with kids because a plot turned on astrology. To talk about astronomy, astrology, you know, what, how are these different, how are they related? Um, so we want to really make it um, a very, sort of a living community that brings the central thrust of these classic plays that are mostly common core text exemplars, the overlay of the common core rigor in terms of how do you investigate such text to create meaning, but then on top of that, the theatrical and the sort of interdisciplinary community of adults who could be willing to join kids for 15 minutes, you know, from their laptop for Google Hangouts, and then we could store those, obviously, and, and, and that can become a library of, of interactions that are pertinent to the festival that you're putting together, you know, for your school, your classroom. Festival meaning whatever you want to make of it. Um, so I, I know that's a lot of us talking. I'm so sorry, but it's a, it's a, it's um, a long. You know, I asked the NBC guy, "How do you encapsulate our work so quickly in two minutes?" He said, I haven't been doing it for 30 years. You know, so you know, I don't. You know, I, I'm not full of all the little details and anecdotes, but you are. So that's why we talk too much. Um, That's great. We record it and then we put it in some kind of pictures and then they get to see it and yeah. put it on the web. Because the other thing is the aspect of audience. Right. This, That's to, the in today's day and age, you know, the audience is out there and anytime that we say, oh, it's going on the web page, it's, it just means a lot more to them. It's That's like, right. Yeah, it focuses attention and, and creates energy. We do a lot of like, global classroom kinds of things and um, I think it gets really perfect. Really yeah. yeah. Well, like I say, you should have a, a little limitation. Uh, basically, what will happen is uh, uh, when you get in touch with us, and uh, I'll create basically a, a page just for each person, one uh, password. So let's say you have 50 kids or something that you're teaching. 
you know, you can give them all the same password to the same URL. They can access the same thing from anywhere. The software remembers where each device left off. So if you leave off, you know, on your whiteboard one day, it'll pick up right where you left off. Or if a kid at home was looking at it via tablet or PC or whatever, it'll just remember where they left off. So it just brings you back to where you left off. Or you can start it over, you know, either way. But it's, uh, it's literally software that uh, didn't exist before 2013. So it's, um, uh, you know, uh, we're very pleased to have it, um, you know, available for, you know, non, we're sort of non-technical creative people. But, uh, you know, it's, it's great that these tools are now uh, coming up so that we can publish uh, in a, a whole new way than I was able to with Weekly Reader. Uh, Believe me, correcting something, that if you see a typo and you've just printed seven and a half million copies of something, it breaks your heart. <laughs> but this is a way for kids to, when we set it up, we'll also put a blog to all that. Right, so that you guys can upload student work. Part of the idea of festival should be that the student, work, it should be almost like a, a drama fair, like a science fair more than a, you know, like it's not necessarily a festival in the sense that kids have to perform or you have to be a drama specialist but more of a festival in the sense of let's involve everybody's work in... in it's a community. It's, it, we, it doesn't have a term for it yet, but, uh, you know, I just pulled this up so you could see. Thank you. I'll just... There's a, there's a two-minute introduction to Macbeth. You might... That's, that's a little more of the high school style. Yeah, yeah. certainly. And then so the rest of it would be similar to the elementary with 